Good evening, dear church. It is another great time to be in the presence of God, to be here in church, to glorify his name, and to read a scripture. Today I will be speaking about coming into God's presence. I was reading through the book of Leviticus, and I guess finally at that time it kind of stumped me how crazy or how, um, how back in the Old Testament how the Israelites were able to come to the presence of God, how much more complex it was. It may seem like today in the modern day age, how we may sometimes can take this for granted. Now, if we read back there in the Old Testament, the importance of entering holiness was much more emphasized, it was more articulate. And as we see, it can also be very complex. But today, as I mentioned, is available to anyone who chooses to enter into his presence with a clear conscience, boldly believing that they are entering the presence of God. I'd like to start off by reading from Leviticus chapter five, where it, well, it kind of hit me. In Leviticus chapter five, starting from verse one, if anyone sins because they do not, sorry, if anyone sins because they do not speak up when they hear a public charge to testify regarding something they have seen or learned about, they will be held responsible. I'd like to skip, skip over to verse five. When anyone becomes aware that they are guilty in any of these matters, they must confess in what they have sinned. As a penalty for the sin they have committed, they must bring to the Lord a female lamb or goat from the flock as a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for them for their sin. Anyone who cannot afford a lamb is to bring two doves or two young pigeons to the Lord as a penalty for their sin, one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. They are to bring them to the priest who shall first offer the one for the sin offering. He is to wring its head from its neck, not dividing it completely, and is to splash some of the blood of the sin offering against the side of the altar. The rest of the blood must be drained out at the base of the altar. It is a sin offering. The priest shall then offer the other as a burnt offering in the prescribed way and make atonement for them for the sin they have committed and they will be forgiven. It's interesting to read here, well, even the first few chapters in Leviticus, the very instructions of how to bring this animal to sacrifice. It is also very detailed on the conditions the animal must meet to also bring to sacrifice. We see that these animals are sacrificed for the atonement of that individual that brings it. That the blood was spilt for their sins or for whatever other purposes the offering was. Even these animals read, um, as we see, God is most high and of holy of holies. Without doing such sacrifices, the priests would not be allowed to enter into the presence of God without purifying themselves with these sacrifices. Now I kept thinking, why must there always be blood involved why not, out of the many creations out there, some sort of other procedure without having so much blood being spilt? But we get a clear answer if we go on to Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. This is when God speaks to the Israelites why they must not eat blood. Verse 11, for the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to, make, and I've given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Our blood is the very life force that makes us, well, live. It gets pumped throughout our whole entire body. So the Israelites brought these animals so that the animals may die in place of them. Now, also, must, because of the wages of sin is death. But one thing you also think is, can you imagine how much blood must have been spilt on an average on a day to make atonement for your sins? I should have maybe asked to show a picture of the temple into sections that has been divided. I'm sure some of you may have seen that it goes from a bigger place of meeting to down to the Holy of Holies where it was separated with a veil where the Ark of the Covenant was. That veil, following these procedures, the only way the priest can enter, and that veil also can symbolize as a separation between man and God. It's, it's cool that I watched this uh, video about Leviticus describing God as a son. It's very big, it's very large, but it's also very dangerous because of the heat when you get too close to it. So unless you are purified, then you can stand in the presence with standing in the dangerous heat. If you get too close to it, as we read in other stories, as in if, 
uh, in the previous, in the Old Testament, if they don't follow the right procedures or if you look into the Ark of the Covenant, God's striking those who enter without following the proper requirements. Starting from 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 19. But God struck down some of the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, putting 70 of them to death because they looked into the ark of the Lord. The people mourned because of the heavy blow the Lord had dealt them. And the people of Beth Shemesh asked, who can stand in the presence of the Lord? The holy God, to whom will the ark go up from here? And another story in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 5. David and all, the, and all of Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord, with castnets, harps, lyres, timbrels, sistrums, and cymbals. When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out and took a hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's, angle burned, the Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. And irreverent meaning showing a lack of respect for people or things that are generally taken very seriously. Therefore, God struck him down, and he died there beside the ark of God. If this is not emphasized enough on how serious it was to enter into the most holy of holies, then I don't know what passages also would show just as much how, um, how important it is. This just shows how great our God is and how holy he is that the people have just died by look, even looking at the ark. Now today, we are blessed by entering into God's presence and that he also may live inside of us, but how? I'd like us to open up to Matthew chapter 27, verses 50. And when Jesus cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split, amen. Now, I remember reading this in my teen years and just couldn't get it. Why did it go from such a dramatic scene of Jesus dying on the cross to a veil and temple being torn to two? There was a missing piece to the puzzle, but of course now, getting more knowledge, it was a mind-blowing moment connecting these passages together here. And I would like to make this connection here from Hebrews chapter nine, verses 12. He did not enter by means of blood and of, of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, obtaining eternal redemption. That Jesus lived out his life as a perfect human, not a spot of sin, no blemish, the perfect sacrifice. To take on the sins of the whole world, Jesus represents us as our holy priest, and it was also the perfect sacrifice to take our atonement. He tore the veil between us and God so that we may come into his presence so that he may dwell within us so that we should be together and there's no separation and he freely gives it to anyone who chooses. But how do we enter now? What is this procedure to be in the presence of God? There's a new covenant after Jesus died and rose back from the dead. If we continue on Hebrews 9 to verse 15, for this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. It's a new covenant that we carry inside of us, and just to be clear what a covenant is, it's basically an agreement between two parties. In this case, new covenant is the promise that God makes with mankind that he will forgive that we forgive sin and restore communion with those whose hearts believe in his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant, and his death on the cross is the basis of this promise. He defeated death by his resurrection and restored life for those who believe in him. To enter, we are to turn away from living on our sinful nature and to come live under God's laws of love. The question I ask myself at a time and now ask you, brother or sister, is there a veil in your life that is separating you from God? You have yet to receive this promise that God gives so freely, promise to live everlasting with him in heaven. There's nothing that you could ever do, no amount of works or even acts of service or even service in church that can save you. 
unless you truly confess and believe in him and receive him into your life. I'd like to open up to Romans chapter 10, verses eight through 13. But what does it say? The Lord is near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart that is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame for there's no difference between Jew and Gentile the same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. In conclusion to this sermon, do not wait to enter into his presence, for he richly blesses, guides, protects, helps, and most of all will save us from death or hell. There may be times it may feel like God's presence isn't there. Maybe he's not giving you an answer that you are looking for. And sometimes we may look and see, why, where, is God, where is God? Why has he gone so far from us? But sometimes we must look and reflect on ourselves and maybe ask ourselves, how far have we gone from him? There could be moments of reflection or learning moments. We are considered children and that he is a loving father that understands that at times we may stumble. For God knows everything. There's nothing that you can ever hide from him. It is your choice whether you want to step back into his light and bring your sins into the light to confess. His love will never end and will always be there and you, he'll be waiting for you to come back into his presence. Amen. Братья и сестры, тоже хотел постараться тоже что-то по-русски рассказать о моей проповеди. Это было пробивание в Божьей присутствии. Я знаю, я прощаю, <смех> прошу прощения, что-то не так понятно. Я читал книгу Левит, и меня поразило, как мы, люди в наше время, воспроменяем вхождение в Божье присутствие как должное. И иногда мы можем забывать, что входим в святое святых. Важность вхождения в его святость была гораздо более сложна. Если мы прочитали, насколько это было сложно, сегодня он доступен любому, кто решит войти с чистой совестью, смело вера, что он находится в присутствии Бога, не принеся никаких жертв искупления наших грехов. Я, я, я все думал, почему самое важное, или что вылез больше, что это почему должно быть пролита кровь за наши грехи. И этот ответ в Левит 17 глава 11 стих. «Потому что душа тела в крови, и я назначил его вам для жертвника, чтобы очищать душу вашу, ибо кровь сия душу очищает». Сегодня мы благословенным Божьим присутствием, который живет внутри нас, как мы прочитали в Матфея 27 глава 50 стих. Иисус же опять, возопив громким голосом, и спустил дух. И вот завес в храме раздралась надвое, сверху до низу, и земля потря... потряс... Ой. потряслась, и камни рас... расселись. Practice enough, sorry. <coughs> Иисус прожил свою жизнь как со... Со... совершенный человек. Порока не было, не, не, пятна... не пятнышка греха. Совершенная жертва. Взять на себя грехи всего мира. Иисус представляет нас как нашего святого священника, а также является совершенной жертвой для нашего искупления. Он разорвал завесу между нами и Богом, чтобы мы могли прийти в Его присутствие, чтобы Он мог обитать внутри нас, чтобы мы могли быть вместе, разделены, э, не разделены. Он бесплатно дается любому, кто хочет пристать перед Ним. Вопрос я задаю вам, я задал себе, если есть ли в вашей жизни завеса, которая отделяет вас от Бога. Аминь. Призываю молитву.